Ah. Yep. Yes, just pressed it. Great. Okay. I won't do my introduction again. I will just uh, move on to the second speaker. That's Jonathan Firth at the University of Strathclyde. The title of his uh, talk, Teacher Research Engagement Purpose, uh, pu purpose that Engagement Purpose, Theoretical Foundations and Effective Practice. I garbled that, Jonathan, away you go. Thanks, David. You, you saved me having to read that bit out, so I appreciate that. Thanks very much for the introduction and a uh, and, uh, great talk uh, from Robert there, which I think is, uh, it does set it up nicely in many ways. My, my talk is not so much uh, an objection, but perhaps some kind of concerns and considerations about how um, teachers um, can uh, engage with research effectively. I do have some slides, so hopefully that will give you um, something to look at other than each other's profile photos for a little while. Um, so essentially, I, I just wanted to start by saying my background was as a psychology school teacher before I moved um, into um, the university sector at Strathclyde, and uh, I'm very interested in the psychology of education. So there might be that kind of slight bias in, in what I'm talking about. Um, and also just to kind of set out a little bit of historical stuff um, in terms of how um, teachers engaging with research has, has developed over the years. Um, which kind of leads up in many ways to what Robert was just talking about with the General Teaching Council and the professional standards. Uh, so one early example was the psychologist and philosopher William James, who gave talks to teachers about how to apply psychology to the classroom back in the 1800s. Um, uh, and, you know, that's maybe it doesn't seem quite so relevant to our immediate context, but actually in some ways quite a similar uh, thing happened in Scotland in the early 20th century, for example, William Boyd at the University of Glasgow um, worked with Scottish teachers, had them come in on Saturday mornings to have talks and also encouraged them to carry out their own practical uh, classroom research investigations. Um, you know, well before perhaps we would consider teacher, teacher research engagement to be uh, you know, a thing. Um, uh, moving on a little bit, um, uh, some of you will be familiar with the work of Lawrence Stenhouse, who's um, sort of conceptualized the idea of the teacher as researcher, a kind of extended professionalism, which in some ways overlaps a lot with what we might think of um, as, uh, as professional reflection on practice, um, but extending more into kind of practical and systematic um, uh, investigations, which I would say are quite similar to perhaps what we're asking people to do in the lines of practitioner inquiry, as, as Robert was just speaking about. Um, I think a useful distinction, you know, kind of thinking about some of the similarities and differences between those three examples, um, when Elaine Hall talk about engaging with, uh, sorry, engaging with research or engaging in research, it's useful perhaps for us to think, are we talking about teachers engaging with research evidence, which I think Robert in his talk was very positive about the idea that we can look at research and pedagogical practice and make sure that teachers know about this or are we talking about the teachers engaging in research and actually doing it themselves and perhaps contributing to new knowledge uh, that way and in some ways i think that there's um, what we have with the donaldson report and gtcs professional update which encourages teachers to engage with research and also to engage in practitioner inquiry um in some ways it's kind of a halfway house it's it's asking teachers to engage um, in research but in quite a limited way and in a way that is perhaps um, prioritizing their professional reflections reflections and practice rather than necessarily novel findings. Um, I, I noticed for example that GCS used to have a database of for teachers to share the findings of the practitioner inquiry that seems to have fallen by the wayside so it seems to be less about them sharing what they find out and more about doing it um, that seems to be the, the emphasis. But, you know, maybe others would, would disagree on that. Um, but I thought it would be useful to think about, you know, what the purposes of these things are, and especially kind of thinking about this distinction between engaging with research and engaging in research. And I should perhaps as, as well say that although I'm probably thinking mainly about classroom teachers here, I would take David's point that he made in the introduction that this really applies to anybody who's doing teaching. It doesn't necessarily need to be a, a school teacher. So in terms of engaging with research, I guess then we're talking about teachers better understanding the research, and this is something that happens in initial teacher education. We want it to be evidence-based and we want to um, explain research and have them discuss it and understand it. Um, this is a part of professional learning. 
And we hope as well, and you know, I think in many ways we assume that this will have an impact on practice. Um, so understanding research on things like assessment and other aspects of pedagogy will have an impact on what the teachers do in their teaching situations and then will have an impact on, on learner um, outcomes and success as well. So, you know, that, that, that all seems kind of positive. But I think that there is a problem, um, which is that actually engaging with anything in quite a deep and meaningful and motivating way often requires doing it. If you asked a science teacher, would it be fine to just kind of tell people about science and never have them do any experiments in the classroom? But most, most of them would probably say, well, that's, a, that's kind of a crazy way to teach science. You're going to get a much better effect if we engage in active learning, if we actually do it. And therefore, you could perhaps make the same argument for teacher research engagement as well. If we're going to tell teachers about research, OK, but perhaps we would get a better effect if they're actually going to engage in research in order to more fully understand it. So I think from that sort of active learning point of view, then you could say the purposes of engaging in research are, are varied. There's, there's more than one possible outcome of that. But, but one could certainly be professional learning as professional active learning. So they're, they're, they're doing it in a more active way and perhaps in a more memorable and impactful way. Um, and I think that possibly along the way, there'll be some upskilling of teachers to fully understand the research. I think as, as I'm sure many of you know, um, when you start engaging in research yourself, you become more aware of some of the issues that make research good quality or, or not so good quality, become more aware of issues like sample size and um, uh, issues such as you know what a correlational result might, might mean or what um, uncontrolled variables are and how they might impact on the outcomes of uh, or, how, or the conclusions of, of research. And perhaps then upskilling teachers to, to do, do the research is also upskilling them to understand and better engage with the research. Um, there could of course be new findings from teachers carrying out their own research and perhaps that would include novel findings in school settings because the majority of academic research is not done in school settings um, and um, you know finding things out in the classroom that have perhaps already been demonstrated in other settings could be worthwhile in itself and you could even look at a lot of teachers engaging in research activities as being a kind of citizen science whereby um, uh, something that one academic researcher could find out in a, in a very controlled way, could be done in a less controlled way, but by a much larger pool of teacher researchers and therefore getting a, a broader picture, not, not necessarily the only um, outcome or the only answer to a question, um, but contributing to knowledge by providing perhaps a fuller picture of how certain things happen when you look at these um, sort of varied classroom uh, processes and classroom outcomes. And perhaps there's also a motivational aspect. Um, it's not terribly motivating to just be told things when you don't really understand them very well. And as you know, we know from things like self-determination theory, it is quite motivating to have some autonomy and choice. And it's quite motivating to feel competent at things. So for teachers to feel competent to engage in research and also to have some choice over what to research um, may actually motivate them to engage with research more fully and more deeply. So um, I guess I would argue then that the, the idea of engaging in research in a more practical way could have many of the benefits and perhaps a bit more strongly so than just asking teachers to engage with the evidence that we perhaps pass on to them as, as academics. I guess you could um, raise a couple of objections to all of this. Um, one is how deeply do teachers really need to engage with research? Anyway, can we not just tell them to teach and say, this is how you do it well, and please just keep repeating that for 40 years and we'll be fine. And uh, certainly that's kind of the argument that we got from um, Dan Willingham, professor of psychology, a very interesting um, academic and, and author who, who suggested that perhaps we shouldn't really tell teachers about complex stuff such as theories, but we should really just tell them the effects that they're going to find in the classroom and tell them, you know, essentially what to do um, on a more surface level. Um, I think there are problems with that, though, because even quite robust effects can be fairly context specific. Um, there are things, um, so for example, um, I'm quite interested in the spacing effect and memory 
which suggests that if we space out practice and we delay practice, you have more effective learning. But there are cases where that um, can even reverse depending on the context. And there's also um, quite a lot of variation depending on the subject matter uh, in terms of how much you should delay the practice. So really for teachers to understand things on a slightly deeper level, I think, is going to have real practical implications. It's not really a case that we can just say, well, this is how teaching works, off you go and do it. I think they really need to have slightly deeper um, grasp on, on why it works that way. Another um, potential objection is really, are we just getting teachers to reinvent the wheel if we ask them to go out and investigate things practically? Uh, and I think Elaine Hall puts this very well in this quote here. There's a lot of time and effort involved. Are we, you know, are we going to give teachers like an hour a week, five hours a week, you know, a day a week um, to carry out practical investigations? When often we already know the answer to a lot of the questions, um, you know, just for the sake of motivating them. Um, I, I had an example of this recently when I was working with some teachers in a practitioner inquiry project, and a lot of them were saying things like, well, we're they were explaining quite elaborate ways that they were going to look at retrieval practice and the idea of kind of self-testing, how it might be better than more kind of passive starters to lessons. Um, and, and I tried to make the, and some of this involved a lot of data gathering, and I tried to make the point that we already have a very solid evidence base on retrieval practice. Do we really need to test it again? Would it perhaps not be better for you to look at how best to do it in your context or how the pupils react to it? Um, it's slightly more nuanced explorations like that, um, more contextualized ones. So I guess that, you know, in terms of reinventing the wheel, we don't really want to spend, all teachers spend a lot of time finding out things that we already know the answer to because there's a very strong evidence base. Um, and that, that idea of contextualizing really comes into play when there is good reason to suppose that there might be variation, say, from subject to subject in secondary school um, or from age group to age group. So I guess then um, balancing that sort of sensitivity to context and the need for teachers to sort of make links to broader effects and findings, um, that is kind of where the theory comes in for me. And uh, the short article I wrote for the um, Sierra theory and philosophy network um, kind of touches on this. I think that, you know, if you look at kind of the chaotic nature of what happens in the classroom a lot of the time, the theory can kind of cut through that chaos and help us to understand what's the underlying pattern. Why is it that this kid found this hard and this other kid didn't find it so hard? Or that this was helpful on this occasion, not on this other occasion? Once we understand sort of the theoretical explanations behind some of these processes, it, it brings a coherence to that. And I think it's important for us to um, uh, give teachers tools to explore that and ensure that any investigation and research isn't just on the surface level. So um, that sounds perhaps a little abstract and I wanted to um, kind of move on to uh, a fairly practical example of that to, to, to kind of tie things up. Um, and that's the difference between performance and learning. Now there's been quite a lot of research on this, particularly in recent years, draws a lot from the work of Robert Bjork and University of California and colleagues, including Nick Soderstrom in this, in this paper. The idea is that really anything that we learn, there needs to be some kind of long-term change for us to really call it learning. So there has to be some relatively permanent change in what we understand or in the skills that we're able to bring to bear uh, for, for a, in a particular domain. But during the practice, during the training, during the instruction, during the lesson, all we can really observe is our performance in the here and now. And according to these researchers, this is often a very good guide to how much learning is really going on. And they say, in fact, it's often negatively correlated. Often the, the harder you make the training, the more long term <clears throat> the, the learning is going to be, but the worse the performance is in the here and now. Whereas if you make the training very easy, then actually not very much learning is going to happen because it's too easy for the learners. So actually the performance and the learning can be negatively correlated. But that's not necessarily obvious to the learner themselves or to the teacher. So they may assume that having done well in the practice situation, that they're learning really well. Or a teacher may give out a, a starter task and they want to investigate for the practitioner inquiry and then give out a task at the end of the lesson, 50 minutes later, well, everyone got 10 out of 10 and think, great, they really learn better with that starter task. But in fact, not taking into account this, um, this uh, kind of distinction between um, performance and learning. So there, uh, another problem then arising, and, and really it's just one example of a broader problem. They may observe one thing and think they're observing something important, and really it may have a, 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 another explanation. 
we may so what we see happening on the surface may actually not be a particularly good guide to what's really going on. Teachers may think they're observing learning when they're in fact they're observing relatively temporary performance. And we see this a lot actually in education. Students going on the basis of intuition because something feels helpful, they might think it's helpful, but in fact, something feeling helpful is not a very good guide to its long-term benefits. So people saying things like this approach works for me or I'm this type of learner, you know, if we go just on the basis of feelings and preferences, then everyone would think that chocolate is much better for you than salad. It's just just preferences is not often a very good guide uh, to these things. And in fact, teachers often have flawed intuitions too. So we see teachers endorsing myths about learning, such as learning styles or left brain versus right brain learners and this kind of stuff. And they don't seem to have very good intuition about evidence based learning, um, evidence based approaches to learning either. And what's more, not, neither of these things seem to change very much with experience. So it's not something self-correcting in the classroom. So I guess just to, to finish up then, you know, what could be the solution to tie up some of these challenges to teachers engaging with research effectively? I guess one thing that I've kind of hinted at quite strongly in what I've just been saying is that really we need a kind of a theory-based professional learning where we're not focusing too much on what's happening on the surface level. And I think for teachers to engage with research, you can't really just set them off and say, just investigate something you find interesting and hope for the best. There really needs to be a kind of a gradual mentored exposure to teacher research where they're led towards the skills. You know, much as what happens in academia, we don't just say, right, off you go and do a PhD, and come back in four years time, tell me how it went. We kind of lead them through it. Um, I think contextualizing we're important. Contextualizing is important, but there's not that much difference between a kid in Aberdeenshire and a kid in Lanarkshire, really. A lot of learning is pretty much the same regardless of where you are. So we need to um, be kind of wary of overplaying uh, that particular point and, and avoid, uh, as the Hall quote said, not just how, kind of reinventing the wheel. And I think when it comes to misconceptions about learning and this idea that we may sort of intuitively go down the wrong path, and I think we need to tackle that head on um, and make new teachers aware of where misconceptions are likely to occur. Um, so I guess that was just a, um, things like the teaching and learning toolkit, which is a list of this is how to teach. Um, I would sort of recommend going for a more kind of uh, theory rooted approach, which was things like what I did in the psychology in the classroom, but just trying, maybe not, I'm sure far from perfectly, but trying to go down that, that approach. Okay, that's me. Thanks very much, Jonathan. That was, uh, again, very rich and an interesting presentation. Um, I, I'm sure we have questions, but uh, I'm looking at time. And so I'm going to move swiftly on. So please keep notes of questions as, as we go through. Um, so it's now uh, my pleasure to introduce from, from uh, across the pond, as they say, in the USA, P the Philosophy of Education Society, uh, Cara Furman from the University of Maine and Christina Camaran Camarano from Salisbury University. Uh, welcome, uh, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Um, gonna just wait a moment. Yep, there we go. Okay, um, so our presentation, um, is again we've been introduced um, conceptualizations of the teacher researcher um, we are talking about the teacher inquirer as philosopher um, and christina if you can move to the next slide thank you so we're coming at this from a different place we're not making an argument for teacher research we're arguing that within a certain kind of teaching specifically more progressive um, education that's focused on the individual learner teacher inquiry is is a, is a given and a necess necessity. Um, and teacher inquiry is um, by what we're looking at is had its kind of heyday in the United States in the 60s to 2003, I would say is when a lot of the publications were coming out. This is work that's based in a teacher's actual classroom. It's focused on the teacher's question and the teacher is studying their classroom, not really for the sake of publication or making grand statements for the field, but for really doing a better job differentiating, thinking about the individual students in their care. So that's kind of what we're looking at. I say that the heyday kind of ended in 2003 because in the United States reforms have made it increasingly difficult for teachers to teach in this particular kind of way with external mandates um, 
really limiting what a teacher can do. But there's a strong set of progressive teachers kind of operating at the margins and um, behind the scenes and in the cracks in the United States still trying to engage in progressive teaching that centers on teacher inquiry. Um, so in this talk, we argue for the value of philosophy as teacher research, and we really focus on models for how we might help teachers as philosophers do this work. And I will turn it to Christina for the next slide. Here. Um, our, our claims for this presentation are that when teachers meet and form a community where philosophical inquiry takes place, they do two things. They honor the vital connection between teaching and philosophy, and they develop new insights to refine their practices and pedagogy. As much as teaching and philosophy are both engaged in the pursuit of a meaningful living, to be a teacher is to be a philosopher. If we do not recognize the relationship, we strip teaching of its, one of its essential dimensions. Uh, philosophy, therefore, we claim, ought to be part of a preparation and the life of teachers. Honing teachers' philosophical inclinations can empower them to better reflect on their own teaching practice and communicate their knowledge. So in the bulletin that we wrote um, for Sarah, we talk about sort of why being a teacher is a philosopher by, for our conception um, and thinking about the kinds of large questions that we would hope a teacher would be asking. Today, we're gonna talk about two examples and in our examples, we'll give, a question, we'll give um, samples of how the teacher is operating as a philosopher and how that's useful. Um, so we're gonna talk about two examples of philosophical teacher inquiry conducted with in-service teachers. Um, so a little different from the previous presentations, we're focusing on people who are already teachers. Um, and I'm gonna talk about a practice called descriptive inquiry and how it was used in public schools, um, largely in New York City and other places in the United States. And then Christina's gonna talk about a philosophy summer institute for teachers. So descriptive inquiry um, is a way of studying teaching. Um, and in, in brief, um, it has a lot of overlap with Paulo Freire's work in the sense that you're making meaning around a shared question um, and that you do it collaboratively. It's different from Paulo Freire because it's not just a philosophical foundation, but there's a methodology that is associated with it. Um, and there's a lot of writing about it. Most recently, uh, my colleague Cecilia Trau and I have a book on it, which is in the slide, but there's been a ton of writing about this over, over the years. So again, it's, it's a small community, but it has um, some weight to it. Descriptive inquiry is always practiced in a circle, and you can see this is a group of um, teachers gathered to, to engage in it. It is a way of studying practice. Um, it is rooted in phenomenolog phenomenology um, as well as in studying uh, from schools. So it's a mix of philosophy and qualitative inquiry um, in the foundations. And some key elements of it that you always sit in a round setting as these colleagues have done. Everybody knows when their turn is and everybody speaks in order. You speak as descriptively as possible. Um, your, the idea is to unpack ideas, and it takes a capacity-oriented approach that the idea is that the maker, whether it's a philosopher or a child, has a purpose and a sense, and that your job to inquire is to make sense of what their purpose is. Um, so an example of how this was operated in schools, um, in the school where I was a teacher, we gathered once a month um, to engage in descriptive inquiry. We would study children's work, we would look at particular children, and we would study ideas. Um, and one idea that I think is clearly has philosophical import was we had issues with recess at the school. Um, children were fighting at recess, children seemed isolated, children were not coming back um, refueled to the classroom. And so we decided to interrogate this as a whole school. The first mode of inquiry was that the teachers were asked to share how they played at recess as children. And in the round format, everybody in the school participated in sharing. And then we pulled themes to think about what, is, what does recess mean for children? Um, the next mode in Dewey and um, form 
we went out to the recess yard with materials and we were instructed to go play <laughs> and then reflect on what we noticed about ourselves. And things that came up was that some people immediately became really clicky on the recess yard. Some people wanted to show off. Some people wanted to play by themselves. And again, this sort of short adult opportunity gave us some more insights. And then the third way that we investigated into this question was we looked at the video of a particular child um, who was struggling at recess. And we watched this child and then the whole staff went and shared what they had noticed from this video. Um, and what came out after our conversation about our own play and then looking at this child was that Teacher after teacher looking at the child described him as isolated, alone, lonely. And then the next person who went after a series of teachers was um, a teacher aide. So these are people in the schools who spend a lot more time one-on-one -on -one with the kids. They're outside with the children, different kind of experience. And she said, I don't see somebody who's lonely. I see somebody who's just playing by themselves. Um, and then a number of teacher aides actually shared a really similar read of it. Um, and so where is this philosophical? It led to us as teachers to have a conversation about the difference between solitude and loneliness and what does it mean to want to be away from others um, and have this much more meaningful, deeper conversation about play, um, which then led to a different way of engaging with the child going forward. Um, that we stopped labeling him automatically as isolated, uh, apart, and started really thinking about, well, what is this child ga gaining possibly from um, his time away from others? And then what might it mean for him to be joining with other people too? How might that help him? Um, so that's one example of how we were doing it. Um, and I'm gonna turn it to Christina to give uh, another example of a philosophical conversation with teachers. Uh, thank you, Kara. Uh so what I'm going to talk to you about is a, um, a summer institute for teachers that um, I did with a colleague in uh, 2018, thanks to a large grant that, that I could use for that. Uh, so we invited uh, local school teachers uh, to join us for one week during the summer, um, where we pretty much kind of, you know, introduced philosophy uh, to them. And, um, uh, so it was a beautiful experience. I'd, I'd like to do that again, but it, you know, it requires some funding. So I'd have to apply, so that takes time. So I'm not doing it right now, but um, something that, um, that I wanted to um, you know, clarify is that, so these are teachers that, that these were teachers that applied uh, to this summer institute. There was a small stipend just enough to kind of make um, up for their time during the summer, but not really significant. Um, and they, um, uh, they, they, they were kind of curious about philosophy, but didn't really know much about it because philosophy is, um, for the most part, completely absent in the, uh, in the educational system in the United States. Uh, so um, my colleague Stephanie and I, we did the, the, the workshop together. We were very really clear that we didn't want to bring philosophy to teachers, uh, but we just wanted to philosophize together with them. Um, the, the assumption there is that what they do is already very philosophical, but we needed to create maybe um, a space where that could come out. So for you know five days, we, we philosophized together for from 8.30 to three with breaks and lunch breaks. And, and, um, and, um, but for the most part, that's all we were doing. Uh, the result was really, I'm showing here um, some metacognitive puppet where they, could, they, they can use in their classrooms to uh, do philosophy with, with their students. But what I really wanted to focus on um, today is uh, you know, this philosophical idea we came up with at the end. In the last day, we were talking about um, how to, you know, how to sustain this uh, philosophical disposition in their daily teaching on the long run. And so we, um, uh, we composed a list of philosophical practices for the teacher. And I was now um, going through the list, you know, we printed it and we have it, I have it on my, on my wall in my office. But uh, one of the things that, um, that, that when I was rereading it, I wanted to share with you was this idea that they had of, you know, cultivating mental images that connect to human condition. And that really brought me back to our conversations where I think one of the most important things we did 
in the uh, workshop was um, um, reconnecting um, to, to uh, seeing teaching as a um, rehumanizing uh, project. Um, there is so much uh, in, uh, in the way that teaching um, is um, at this point expected to happen, at least in this context, uh, that seems to push it away from a humanizing activity. And so teachers uh, felt that they wanted to uh, find ways to, um, to uphold um, maybe images that remind them of, of why they are in the job and the, the moral call to this job. And, uh, and they want to do that uh, in communities with others. Uh, so that was kind of one of the resolutions. Um, the way we did it for a while, we were able to meet once a month uh, here as a small group of uh, philosophical teachers. Um, you know, pandemic stopped everything and I'm looking forward to maybe um, trying to restart uh, now that we're back face to face. Um, but um, the whole point of this institute was really to kind of just reconnect teachers to their philosophical, um, um, their philosophical dispositions that they already have uh, within themselves. Uh, so um, at this point, we get to the conclusions and I'll give it back to Kara. So our different experiences doing philosophy with teachers um, are calls for and affirmations of philosophically grounded inquiry for teachers. Um, we've described two different approaches and what philosophy um, is and how it's cultivated with teachers. And we believe that this helps teachers to stay grounded. Um, and um, the question of whether there is a use for philosophy might be addressed by experiences like the ones we've described and sharing different methods, methods with similar underlying goals, we hope to have demonstrated how philosophy is beneficial for educators in their local communities. Um, and later in the question and answer, we can get at how we're defining um, philosophy and some other questions that are in the chat. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Cara and Christina. That was uh, really, really great. There's um, indeed a question specifically relating to concepts of philosophy and I think the question of interpretation came up in the presentation and reflection, which links very interestingly, I think, with Jonathan's paper too. Maybe we'll get into that if we have time. Um, so yeah, so so thank you again. Um, sorry we don't have time to sort of stop in between each, um, but let me now turn to Katja, uh, who's our final presenter. Uh, Katja Frimberger is a colleague at the University of Strathclyde, and she'll be. Uh, ending today's presentations with a paper which is entitled The Comedic Art of Becoming an Educator. Thank you, Katya. Hello, everybody. Um, well, <clears throat> the, um, I'm not quite living up to my title, but I, I will explain um, and, and get on with it. I have a, a presentation that simply gives you some of the longer quotes, um, so I will share that. Um, when I get to the quotes, otherwise I'm, 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 I'm presentationless. Um, so the significance of the teacher researcher, and with that, the question of the relationship between theory and practice is, as Kentlis tells us in his 2012 paper, and I'm sharing now so you can see the, um, uh, the reference if you wish to follow this up. Um, so the relation between theory and practice is, as Kenkis tells us in his 2012 paper, not only an ongoing debate in educational science, but goes back, goes right back to the beginnings of his institutionalization at German universities. So the first chair for education was established in 1779 in, at the University of Halle. One of education science's early key figures was Johann Friedrich Herbert. Um, who was successor to Immanuel Kant's chair at the University of Prussian Königsberg, is now Kaliningrad in, in Russia. And although the role of educational theory for educational practice and theory and practices interrelationship was indeed a key concern for Herbert, um, Kenkles in the same paper reminds us that he, rather than solving the problem of the theory practice relation, was the first one really to get the ball rolling on the discussion. So um, in the following presentation then, 
I would like to uh, think aloud or start to get my head around Herbert's take on the teacher researcher who is thought to stand and research, if you like, um, at the interface between theory and practice. I'm myself new to the discussion and so I'm, I'm in the process of understanding Herbert's key answer to the educator's curious in-between stance, um, which is um, his answer is pedagogical tact. So allow me for this very short presentation to try to understand Herbert's pedagogical tact. So this will be my main focus. Um, and I will postpone my, my, my real curiosity, my, my subsequent curiosity about the role of comedy in pedagogical tact to a later point when I have had the time to delve a bit deeper and, and, um, and understand a bit more. So pedagogical tact, as um, Ken Cleese in that very paper puts it, is the educator's ability to interrelate the dimensions of theory and practice. Herbert first introduced the notion of pedagogical tact in his 1802 lecture to students in pedagogy. He writes, and here I'm using um, Friesen and Kankli's translation from 2020. <laughs> oh, um, by reflection, reasoning, inquiry, in short, by science, the educator must prepare not his future action in individual cases, as much as himself, his disposition. He must, he, must he must prepare his head as well as his heart to correctly receive, perceive, feel, and judge the phenomena awaiting him in the situation in which he will be placed. If he has, in anticipation, indulged in extensive plans, the practical circumstances will mock him. But if he has equipped himself with theoretical principles, his experience will become clear to him and will teach him what to do in every situation. So pedagogy for Herbert appears both as a practical craft or an art and as a science. And both theory and practice need each other. Herbert's teacher researcher is somebody who engages with theory not only for the sake of pure intellectual inquiry into the nature, purpose, and principles of education, but does so as the precondition for the cultivation of the right kind of tone of mind in the words of an older 1898 translation of the German word for Gemüt. A tactful disposition that can guide the educator's actions within the unexpectedness of the specificities of the pedagogical situation. <coughs> Apologies. Pedagogical tact inserts itself in the gap left by theory, as Herbert puts it and can, although it only develops in practice, not develop without prior engagement with theory. For Herbert, this general technique of pedagogical tact cultivated at the intersection of practice and theory is related to the teachers and the students' general formation as moral agents in the world. But with that, Pedagogical tact is not foremost about cultivating the ability to correctly translate general moral theory or specific educational theory into various rules and guidelines that can guide the specifics of moral educational acts in specific pedagogical situations. The cultivation of pedagogical tact involves instead the students as well as the teacher's ability to use or work from these general principles and moral theory, education theory, not for the deduction of rules per se, but to hone a disposition, this kind of tone of mind. Um, and what Herbert called, with reference to Pestalozzi, a preparation of the mind, a preparation of the head and of the heart that would allow the educator to see, to perceive the world and attend to the world 
and then the education world in particular in the right way, in the tactful way. Herbert called this cultivation of the right perception of the world the aesthetic necessity. And Kenkles explains Herbert's aesthetic necessity for his practical moral philosophy, which also helps us to understand how pedagogical tact as the right kind of perception within the educational world is thought to be brought to life in the individual educator. This is the quote. Um, can you see the quote, yeah? Okay, super. Aesthetic necessity then is a judgment about a specific situation that manifests itself as irrefutable judgment, although it still is only a judgment of taste and therefore not in principle irrefutable. Simply, simple aesthetic circumstances induce simple basic judgments. Therefore, Herbert's idea of practical philosophy does not include abstract moral laws from which maxims or rules for individual cases are to be deduced. For him, practical philosophy is about ordering those countless basic judgments that manifest themselves in a person by rightly perceiving the world. Pedagogical tact as the right kind of perception forms when the educator improvises in the gap left by theory, the ideal, and develops a certain kind of, I quote, have it here again, develops a certain kind of wit, a certain tact, a quick judge and decision, not proceeding like routine, but also unable to boast as a universal thoroughgoing theory should. The question if somebody will be a good or a bad educator depends for Herbert on this very formation of their pedagogical tact and in how far it will direct the educator's mind and actions faithfully to the universal laws articulated by pedagogic science. But again, faithfully here does not, um, however, mean that a well-developed tact can guarantee all the right answers in terms of what to do and what not to do in each pedagogical situation. As Kenkis points out in the quote, a pedagogical judgment as an aesthetic judgment is, although working from general principles, an expression of the individual educator subjectivity in a specific situation, and as such, cannot claim the same universality that Herbert ascribes to a well-developed coherent theory. As the formation of a practical, moral aesthetic disposition, tact is described by Herbert as a dramaturgical ability to improvise that unfolds from the educator's right perception of the world, stimulated by the general moral education principles, such as, for example, um, Herbert's general um, idea of educability or plasticity of human beings. Exercising pedagogical tact is then indeed to be true to the idea, for example, with regard to the educability of human beings, um, whilst also, as Herbert puts it, and I quote Herbert again, whilst it's also trusting one's own powers of invention to hit upon the one thing that needs to be done at any given moment. And Herbert adds, it should also involve a kind of openness to be instructed by one's failures. The educator's pedagogical task is characterized by as he described it, a kind of wit, a quickness and dexterity that confidently responds to the requirements of the moment, as a pedagogical moment, and is open and is also open to learn from one's mistakes. But which, as Jakob Mutlet in 1962 emphasized, also importantly involves the educator's reserve. So reserve describes here the educator's non-influence and non-interference as part of the educator's dramaturgical ability and is, as Mood described it, an omission rather than an overt act as such. Mood's emphasis on reserve, however, is not, however, a kind of stepping out of the pedagogical relationship by the educator <clears throat> and of keeping a distance um, from the student, but reserve is exercise where appropriate, of course, 
as part of the pedagogical relationship itself, with an eye on the student's self-development and self-activity, and kind of their finding of um, their own purpose and path in life. Um, mood, and differently to Prussian Herbert, is writing with a sort of post-World War II awareness of the dangers of conformity, critiquing the dominance of economic transactional models that apply commodity relations to the sphere of human relations. And, <clears throat> and critiques this kind of thinking of the individual as an organizational unit in a wider network of economic production. Um, so, so Takt Vermut seems to be also a sort of reaffirmation of the, the student and the teacher as an autonomous thinking, feeling, moral agents in the world. Um, I just want to look at this quote um, from Mut in, in Friesen's translation. So the sensitivity which characterizes that which is tactful is a feeling for the you, for the thou, for one's fellow human being, for the singularity and singular rights of the other. There's a respect for the ultimate inaccessibility of the other. So Jakob Muth seems to, like Herbert, emphasize the necessary unpredictability of pedagogical situations that cannot be fully pre-planned. But this is not a gap that can be closed as such by pedagogical tact to ultimately embody the education principle and tactful action and right perception, as Herbert perhaps thought, or perhaps as Mood thought, Herbert thought. Tact is described by Mood as a dramaturgical ability that firstly respects and acknowledges, acknowledges the student as an independent acting agent in the world. And <clears throat> when reading Mood, um, it kind of appeared to me that he perhaps thought that Herbert was a bit too keen or too Prussian, perhaps, regarding um, this kind of presupposition of a complete theory. And if you look at Herbert's introductory lecture, he seems indeed quite confident that he would be able, so at these kind of birthing stages of education science, that he would be able to uncover indeed or claim um, at some point the kind of universal ethical and psychological principles um, for this project of pedagogical tact. Um, but I need to, I need to look into this more, so I can't say I, I can't say too much about it. So I tactfully, <laughs> I tactfully and act reserve here. <laughs> um, so you can see tact as a, a quite an interesting concept that you know Herbert introduced to education science, um, and I'm intrigued by it, and I'm intrigued how it frames. Um, our discussions or how can frame our discussions of pedagogical situations and pedagogical phenomena. Um, and of course, you already see that perhaps because perhaps because um, Herbert was kind of looking, um, he had such a, um, uh, you know, his thing was um, the wider moral formation of, of the student and the teacher. Um, and perhaps this allows us also to discuss pedagogical tact within out, out with the school and within wider human relations. Uh, of course, you know, an application and all sorts of application from the theater to the community center to God knows what you, I'm sure you have ideas about this. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm just, I, I just want to close with saying I'm, I'm generally intrigued by, by this uh, notion of pedagogical tact and, and what we can do in terms of framing um, our pedagogical discussions. And um, I've recently, just, just to end on this, I've recently um, started to read a, a current book on pedagogical tact by, um, unfortunately it's only available in German, by um, two authors called Silfas and Burkhardt. And um, they're emphasizing this role of pedagogical tact, not, not so much, again, in the kind of, perhaps in Herbert's spirit, not to not so much give us answers about um, what we should do, but instead as a sort of, um, they call it a problematization formula, a problematisierungsformel. So, and, and that pedagogical tech might help us to problematize um, phenomena, things that we 
observe in our lived experience of, of pedagogical relations and, and pedagogical situations um, rather than rather than come up with solutions and I, I, I think I find that um, encouraging and I, I wonder what, what you think about that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you Katja that was again really fascinating rich um, interesting um, yeah, I, I have lots of questions. I'm, 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 well, I'll, I'll wait for the questions to come in. Or I'll invite questions to be presented. So um, please put your questions in the chat or raise a hand. We don't have very long. We have a few minutes for any. Is that the end of the the set the, the talks? If so, we that, can stop the recording. That's right. That is the end of the. Yeah, the I'll do that. Thanks, David. All right. So we'll end the recording there. So you're able to ask something silly or something very serious you're not going to be recorded 